Okay, everyone, thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, we are uh, running this special topics uh, webinar for cooperative management uh, for governance leaders, as well as people in leadership roles within the cooperative economy. Uh, I'm Erin Hancock. I'm the program manager for the education programs, at the International Center for Cooperative Management. And we do want to acknowledge that these are exceptional times and that we're all taking things day by day. But we're so pleased that we have folks like, like Bob and other thought leaders who are willing to work with us in continuing these important conversations, especially in light of what's going on. Uh, so let's see um, if you weren't able to tune in to the last three webinars in the series. We had three already very different topics, again, related to cooperative management and leadership. Those are available, uh, the video recordings of those are available on our website at managementstudies.coa. Uh, we also have another one, a fifth just added to our series coming up, and I'll speak to that at the end. But again, you can also see that register for that at managementstudies.coa, but I'll include the registration link here as well. Uh, so uh, let's see. So if you don't know the International Center for Cooperative Management, uh, we are happy to provide a role in this important uh, economy in our society and our eco uh, ecological situation today in order to help elevate cooperative learning and research and the practice of cooperation. And so through that, you may have heard that we offer an online MBA style uh, cooperative master's program in co-op business. So we do that a graduate diploma as well as the certificate program. And I've included links uh, in the handouts uh, section of your menu there. You'll see uh, some information on those programs as well. We also offer these webinar series. We have a symposium. We're doing one on governance next year. Uh, do a lot of, of leadership training, executive education as well. So playing our part in, in elevating this co-op economy. So the title of today's webinar is Break Free from Our Systems Prison, A Human-Centered Way of Thinking About and Managing Cooperatives. And we have Bob Canal joining us from the UK today. So thank you, Bob, for being here. I'll tell you a little bit about Bob before I hand it over to him. So he spent his working life helping to manage and support worker-owned cooperatives in the UK. He was the personnel officer for SUMA, and you can see more about them at SUMA.coop. You'll hear more, obviously, today, too. Um, that was during the 20 years when the worker co-op grew to be one of the largest businesses in its locality and a wealth generating machine for its workers and their communities. So Bob has had a various amount of roles. I don't think that man sleeps. Um, he's advised many U.S. worker co-ops. He co-authored uh, Co-ops UK Code of Governance for Worker Cooperatives, and he was the UK representative for the International Co-op Alliance Worker Co-op Sector Organization, CICOPA, and vice chair of uh, the European region, CICOPA. Uh, he is an ecology graduate and political economy postgrad, uh, which he credits for his analytical and independent approach to management and organizational thinking. So we always like to push the conversation, put the box, push the box that we all find ourselves in sometimes. And I think you'll see that Bob will do that for us today. So Bob, over to you. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Erin. Thank you. Um, sorry to hear about that in uh, Canada. Terrible. Anyway, so. Um... Well, thanks very much, everyone, for uh, coming today to listen to one of my favourite subjects. Um, as you've heard, I've got a lot of experience with practical people management in, in co-ops. Um, fortunately for me, in one of the strangest businesses I've ever come across, SUMA, uh, most people don't actually know that SUMA has no chief executive or management director. Management is seen very much as a function, not a status. It, all workers have gross equal wage and there's widespread multi-skilling and job rotation and endemic arguing and disputation. But uh, yet yeah, SUMA shows amazing business performance, uh, long-term growth and market spread to exports to 55 countries now, uh, now that I've left of course. <laughs> um, and uh, rapidly overcomes external crises and and corporate competition that should just crush it. Uh, the return on capital employed is over 130 percent. This is in a food distribution business. This is astonishing. Apple has a return on capital employed of 28 percent, which means that workers incomes are double the industry average with absolute job security yet it breaks almost every rule in the management textbook um now why you know what what is going on here 
I, I spent years trying to help Zuma to improve as a business uh, more than it did. And it, it almost sometimes seemed to be improving despite me or in spite of me and what I was trying to do. And I kept on trying to apply normal business techniques uh, and, and models that came from various textbooks and courses that I did, uh, including my Chartered Institute personal development degree. Um, and none of them really worked. They were they all messed things up. Um, they either didn't achieve the objectives that I was hoping for, uh, or it, it generated unwanted consequences. People got annoyed, they lost morale, uh, they lost their personal initiative. And sometimes I also saw, not so much in SUMA where we were very careful to avoid this, but these sorts of systems-based management, these orthodox normal management techniques, uh, subverted the co-op, the setting up of them and us, and a polarity and a hierarchy. Uh, and the hierarchy, the people at the top, rapidly, in some cases, became an oligarchy. And you, you can see some pretty famous co-ops completely collapse and degrade as a result of that process. The most famous one is Burley Bike Trailers, which was, off, which was described as the US Sumer at one time. They were so radical that they've gone completely now. It's a privately owned business now once they started to use hard, um, orthodox management techniques so what is this well what is an organization and what is a cooperative um oh i'm not using my slides sorry i got too carried away so this is suma uh about three years ago celebrating their 40th uh anniversary i just left by this time uh, lots of lovely normal people running a business which they own uh, without any external interference. So it's all up to them in a tough marketplace. And this is a, a gratuitous picture of a new Suma truck in beautiful English countryside. I think they've parked up for the night and they're going to sleep there. Lucky driver. But uh, this is when I used to do deliveries. This is the sort of countryside in Yorkshire that I would be driving around. I'd always have to tear myself away. Um, so what, what is going on here? So uh, let's go back, actually, uh, and come to that one. Um, what is a cooperative? Well, the International Cooperative Alliance defines a cooperative as an association of persons united to meet their common needs, in brief. So uh, we could reasonably say, so how do we achieve an association of persons united? How do we focus on how people, should we not focus on how people associate rather than the association, which is the usual way we do it. We focus on the cooperative rather than the cooperating, as if sometimes there weren't any people involved at all. And that, of course, is one of the problems with uh, our normal um, way of looking at businesses and organisations. And yet, we don't really know what an organisation is. We can see the signs of an organisation. We can see um, the branding, premises, equipment. Um, we'll have a look at some. I'm not using my slides very well. Sorry about this. So here's some pictures of an organisation. This is also SUMA. So we've got a typical office and a typical warehouse. So we can say, well, there's something here. There's something happening here. Um, there's lots of signs of a business. But I've been into businesses when they've closed, um, like the day after they've closed. And, you know, this thing, this elusive thing called the, an organization ceases to exist. There's still the name on the door, the lights are on, papers on desks, the phones are ringing unanswered. Mugs and plates, computer screens still showing the symbols of the business. There might be people, but they're just clearing up. And where did it go? And yet, most of our uh, way of thinking is that this is a real concrete thing, this organization. Um, and, and from it, we've developed this idea of systems theory. Um, so, I'll just have a little bit about where systems came from. 
um, you've got the handout, so you'll be able to uh, refer to this. It came from the 18th century in Western Europe, and people were trying to find a way of thinking about dynamic activities, agriculture, shipping, business, which didn't depend on the divine control or to make them work or delegated right of kings, you know, with the divine right of kings. And they used uh, Greek ideas, uh, and this is important, a workaround observation that dynamic objects influence each other in predictable ways. And those ways can be described by rules, not necessarily causal, but you know, they can be described by rules as if the objects or agents were parts of a whole, a system, and that is basically systems theory. And that led on to people believing that organizations are systems. And it's interesting that, uh, let's try another click. Yeah, here we go, Immanuel Kant who was one of the leading philosophers uh, of the Enlightenment, he warned against the use of even as if systems thinking in relation to human thought or behavior, not human bodies, but thought or behavior, because neither of which can be reliably predicted, neither thinking nor behavior by discoverable rules because humans possess free will and can unpredictably decide to do something different. And this warning was ignored. Um, by the use of authoritarian power relationships in business, so humans ceased to have free will and became automatons, systems theory became the dominant thinking uh, about how organizations operate. And that these things, these, this work around this as if system is actually real, concrete, and can be manipulated by managers to make them behave in desired ways, usually by using management authority, which is often not even thought about. So for example, um, appraisals and performance reviews, they're really difficult to do if both a reviewer and reviewee are of an equal status. They're really easy to do if the reviewer has a dominant uh, status. Uh, I know this from experience. So in this systems idea, people become human resources subordinate to the system. And this operates at every single level, you know, from the economy, uh, businesses, religions, wherever. So what it is an organization? If uh, we have this problem that, uh, you know, you know, where does he go when the people leave? Well, Ralph Stacey, who was himself a working manager in many corporate organizations, and he was charged with making performance management changes and strategic management changes uh, and had a, a long career doing that and became extremely unhappy uh, with the lack of uh, efficacy of the tools that lots of people were promoting and selling him. Um, and so he then eventually left uh, management and became an academic and researched this whole thing. You know, what is, this, what is an organization? What, what are we doing here? And went back to those early days. All these ideas came from, come from his books. The, that's the seventh edition of his classic textbook. And I'd recommend you don't go beyond back be, be, before uh, edition four, because this certainly evolved. And before edition four, his thinking was quite different. Um, you can get six very cheaply secondhand. Or the seventh, I think, is probably available secondhand now. Uh, you know, if you having to buy it yourself, it's quite expensive. And boy, boy, it will keep you occupied for years plowing through it. It's really dense. Uh, I love stuff like that. Uh, so what he uh, said, using uh, the works of pragmatic psychologists and process sociologists, he said that organizations are in fact, pragmatic sociologists, what am I looking at? What am I seeing? the communications of the humans involved in them. So an organization is not a concrete thing, 
it is a conversation in which people are engaging. And that is a revolutionary idea. So he calls this process uh, terrible branding. This it really, really needs a, a, a snappy way of describing this, but this is actually accurate anyway. These communications are complex. They cannot be measured. They don't necessarily obey rules. They might tend to follow themes temporarily. They are responsive. So a gesture made as, as a, a, a communication attempt, and that could be visual, body language, music, physical, or any other means, calls forth a response in the person sensing it, which in turn generates further responses which is what he means by responsive and these communications are processes that have no beginning or end uh, but they do conform to time so we typically there will be turn taking and and they proceed through time but not space and this is interesting because you can't actually limit communications and less and less can we do that uh, with uh, the spread of uh, modern uh, information technology. So the idea that you can have an inside or an outside of a system or a subsystem or a meta system is uh, very, very difficult. Um, let's have a look at, uh, I've got a li little bit lost here. No, I know where I'm going. Yeah, I haven't got the slides in front of me. This is a problem. I'm trying to remember which order they're in. Okay, so this complex responsive process of relating is how we as fundamentally social beings relate to each other and to ourselves, that silent conversation that goes on in our head all the time. We're doing the same thing to ourselves, gesturing and responding in a very complex way. And it's how we actually get along with each other in organizations, whether that's a, a capitalist international corporation or a hippie weed growing collective. And in our normal daily lives, there's no difference. We, we don't, as some uh, textbooks try to pretend, become different people when we go to work. We are all complex, responsive um, processes of relating. Now, what's interesting is that this immediately frees us from the idea of a discrete concrete system that can be controlled by a leader and even for the necessity of hierarchy. Although hierarchy and power relations obviously still exist and they, they, are, um, uh, they are played out by including or excluding people from communication, which we know full well, that's the way it, power is often used. And this way of thinking gives us a completely different way of approaching the idea of how organizations work, including in a new vocabulary, a verb based vocabulary, which does not imply an underlying systems model of things, which is noun based. Some people might use a biological metaphor uh, because they say this is alive, it's, it's living, but we mustn't think of it as, have, as having any life in itself. It's alive because of the communications and the relating of the people involved in it. And when those people go, when they leave, poof, it just evaporates into thin air. And then it, it's then just degree is what was left, the signs are then cleared away and got rid of. The biggest organization can just go in a second, as we've seen with some of the big uh, corporations that just collapse like. Uh, Lehman Brothers or Enron or others. Um, and okay, so um, let's move on a bit. Right, uh, I need to have a look at the next slide because I've got a bit lost. Here we go. Right, I'll go back again. Yeah, I'll go back again. Oops, 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 oops. Sorry about this. Here we go. Yes, this is a bit difficult. I could do with having them along the bottom of this, my screen. And so I can see what they what they are. Um, now the thing is that this uh, complex responsive process relating or CRPR based management is ideal for cooperatives 
because to be successful, a cooperative needs good communication between members and between the organization and its members. And CRPR prioritizes, it prioritizes communication and relationships. And as I said in my handout, we should really say communicating and relating in, in, in our co-op. But it sounds odd, doesn't it? You know, we got so used to using abstract nouns and not active verbs. So I found this a brilliant way of approaching how to improve the way that people get along together in uh, a worker-owned cooperative with virtually, well, very low hierarchy. Obviously, there's, there's some, you know, the older people had more authority than the newer people and such like, it's only human. Um, and going through Stacey's uh, fourth edition, uh, when I, I did this and you got it on the, uh, page three of the handout, I came up with a whole list of things that you could immediately start to uh, apply in a worker co-op. So I won't go through the whole list because uh, you can read it for yourselves. So make resources available to allow conversation type communication. That's revolutionary. Um, not many people are allowed to do that in organizations. So uh maintain co-creation of the future so prevent stuck ideology or cult thinking where people are punished for thinking outside the box um, use emergent thinking rather than predictive planning predictive planning that assumes that you can control the whole concrete system whereas emergent is no you can't you have to work with what's emerging and try and encourage what you think is good and uh, discourage what you think is not good. Uh, manage anxiety, dependency, fight or flight. So find ways of doing that. So people have an open, trusting conversation with each other. And you can go through all of this list. What my point here is that, oh, I love this one, not mistake the tools for communication with communication. We have sent out 10 newsletters this year yeah nobody read them you know that sort of thing um live with perpetual negotiation well most practicing managers know that that's a fact of life but some people pretend it isn't so and it's even more so in a worker co-op and good that's the way it ought to be because the best things usually happen as a result of perpetual negotiation so I'm not going to go through the rest of the list, but you can see how practical and applicable this is straight away. So we're encouraging self-management and self-organization. Now, the funny thing is that most managers find this idea that collective self-management is all there is to be an existential terror. They find it horrific because this system ide systemic ideology is so ingrained. A loss of control is too horrible to contemplate, and I have experienced this. People will go to great lengths to have a plan for the future, even though they know that plan is unachievable, but the plan makes them feel comfortable. Or as Napoleon once said, the digression, I mustn't do this, I go off. And yeah. Anyway, as Napoleon once said, when asked why he was such a successful military commander, he said, I look at the ground and my opposition look at maps. Well, yes, I'm sure he didn't negotiate. Uh, now, where are the tools that we can use? Well, this is quite a minority sport, uh, complex responsive processes of relating. Um, and Stacey doesn't do, so, do us any favours favors by making his writing so difficult to understand, something which is actually very simple. Uh, there aren't any specific techniques and tools that I have found, but you can select from standard methods those which are uh, contain the elements of complex responsive processes of relating and are therefore co-op friendly and then avoid those which lock co-ops into systems or hierarchy ideology. And two examples uh, from project management. There's a lot more in the table at the back in the appendix. So this is uh, a systems-based 
project management tool, PRINCE2. This is a process model diagram. And I, I did not go looking for this. This was one of the first ones that popped up and I recognize this because I know a bit about PRINCE2. And you can see, first of all, how non-intuitive it is uh, and how it's trying to control everything that's going on. So it's, it means projects in controlled environments, PRINCE. Um, and it needs a strong authority hierarchy to achieve the preconceived actions during a long timetable to get to the preconceived goal. And how, can, how is this supposed to work in a cooperative of self-initiating, self-organizing worker members? Again, you know, but people still try it and then they get disappointed when it doesn't work because everybody says you have to have it. And many local authorities require Prince too when they're handing out contracts to contractors to um, do things like design IT systems for them or set up delivery networks and things like that. It's very, very dominant. Now the alternative, agile, agile uh, project management. They use small, iterative, repeated steps called sprints that last from a couple of days to two weeks and the outcome of which are then checked against current thinking people change their minds to inform the next round of sprints so interactive communication and conversational communication is essential so they don't go off in the wrong direction and the results emerge and as you can see there we've got three sprints circles you know you have a, a you plan something you design then you build it test it then review it with whoever you're working for uh and and then if it's okay you, you launch that and then you do another one and then another one and it can change at any time so you can see how agile is is co-op friendly but for a manager who's charged with delivering a project is horrifying because they don't know what's going to come out of it at the end they can't say this is going to happen i will it to happen okay so do uh do CRPR management techniques work? Uh, well, of course, uh, I'm just gonna have a look at the next slide. Oops, not yet. Oh, I've given the game away there. <laughs> Never mind, we'll get on to it. Of the three realms of management, uh, which I, this is my way of describing it, operational, tactical, and strategic. Systems methods work okay in the first two. So weekly, monthly operational planning, or tactical couple of months yearly planning you can set plans and then they're implemented by negotiation so it's like uh, you know th th this is the rough place where we want to be and then let's argue about it and see whether it is and where we get and you know we'll work it out as we go along it uh, what happens will emerge um now that's openly in worker co-ops, because what Stacy says is it happens all the time in all organizations, but in hierarchical organizations, it's tacitly, you know, there'll be sabotage, there'll be people saying they're doing one thing and doing another, um, and uh, and, you know, and the, the cybernetic closing in on the final goals, which is what all the senior managers are told to do, they'll find we can't get there, it's not, the system is not behaving as we expected. Now, of course, you think, how on earth can we do this? We, we can't negotiate all the time. Well, no, we don't, because we come up with sort of collective agreements, what, what uh, Mead called social objects. So, for example, we might agree a social object such as a work roster. Um, the actual thing that's going on is the complex social relating of the agreement and HR people are told this, you know, the, 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 the employment contract is just a sign of the agreement. The agreement is the actual living agreement as it currently exists, um, which is probably why I, I think like this. Um, the actual thing is the complex social relating of the agreement. But it's reification, the material sign is the roster spreadsheet, which we agree exists as a thing, but it's not a concrete thing. It's just a social object that we socially agree exists. 
And this as well is revolutionary because it emphasizes the relating more than the sign. Whereas in most management, the sign is the thing and the relating has to be made to fit the sign. And that's why standard HR is a disaster in worker co-ops, as it, many people would tell you. So in CRPR management, we start by building the relating before we start on the social objects. And we recognize that things like job descriptions, rosters, budgets, and business plans are merely the signs of our agreement and not things in themselves. And even, for example, um, co-op development strategies. So we start in a different angle. We do what the uh, North American intentional communities, the, the co-housing movement do. They spend 18 months building the relationships between the members of the group before they put all their money in the pot by the land and the buildings. And that's from bitter experience of doing it the other way around and losing everything in huge arguments and fighting. And so we should be doing that with co-ops so that once the co-op starts and goes, it's really running well and it isn't hobbling along, tripping up, falling over, getting held back by arguments as people learn to work together or to use build social capital in, uh, in system speak. Uh, but it's also very effective because I've used it and I've taught other people how to use these principles without using the jargon. Um, you just talk about good communication, good good conversations, do it by conversation, you know, get agreement first, the build of the agreement first, rather than issuing a, a, an order that we will do this and then fighting people to take part. And people love it because it's the way we normally relate to each other and we can do it better and uh, it helps us in the rest of our life as well. Where if we can do this at work, then we can do it at home with our friends. Um, but the strategy is where the big gap was. Um, and Stacy found the gap between system theory methods and how people actually get along was widest in the far future realm of strategic management, you know, where it's not predictable. We don't know what's gonna happen. Um, and the dominant strategic management model at the moment is strategic choice, which is the vision, analysis, plan, action, review uh, model. It's sort of in the middle between early mechanistic systems, um, cybernetics. Oh, I did miss a slide out. I just got to show you this one. Uh, let's go back and find this. And Bob, just five to 10 minutes before questions. Sure. Yeah, sure. So this is a this is a systems model, and you can see there's no people in it. This is a systems model of an organisation. It's all pro. It's all uh, things to do. There's customers, but anyway. Okay, let's go back. Let's go back on. Yep, five minutes. Good. Uh, and the problem with uh, a strategic choice is that. It takes an awful long time to do the uh, assessment and analysis and action planning. But it's at the implementation that the unbridgeable gap it becomes apparent between the wish of the controller and the experienced reality of participants. And many managers know that awful merry-go-round carousel of the three-year strategic plan, where every three years a new chief executive says, We need a strategic plan and they're stuck back into that groundhog day torture of here we go again we know this isn't going to work um so what should we be doing well how can we find i'm going to finish in just a couple of minutes how can we find a, a strategic management technique that is more crpr friendly more co-op friendly and there is one appreciative inquiry which interestingly is the only one, as far as I can tell, for which objective evidence exists that it works. And you can see here, it's about working together. Uh, the, the consultant works with people, asking them questions, and encouraging them to converse about what's good about this place. What could it be like? You know, Why don't we just do more of what's good and make it happen better? And that isn't just sitting around doing nothing. People want to be productive. And then co-constructing together how we would like it to be. 
and then sustaining it together, working in those relationships that mean that this is actually going to lock in and it's going to work. And so in all as aspects, you can actually find um, you can find these things that are more uh, cult friendly, CRPR friendly. I'm going to stop there. I'm just going to go back to Bill Murray just because I think this is an utterly brilliant film. Uh, okay, Erin, I've finished. Questions, please. Okay, thank you so much. I, I'm definitely hearing a lot that challenges what is the default and what is the norm. And I, I think that uh, one of the things that we notice is that these things do feel like we're sort of acting like machines when that doesn't necessarily fit right the fact that we are uh, human centered in how we operate, but we don't have alternatives at our fingertips, then what do we do? You know, we default to what's taught in business school or what the, the common business speak is. So I appreciate that uh, you're providing us a bit of fuel and uh, fluency in something, uh, a departure from what is the default. Right, okay. So, so we've had, okay, so we have, uh, Ushnish, did you want me to unmute you and you can go ahead and ask your question? Then that way we can start getting some other uh, voices here in the uh, in the conversation too. So let me just unmute you. Okay, go ahead and ask your question. Um, so my question is: um, Are co-ops limited in any way by the management skills the initial members have, and is it better to train those members in you know some specialized co-op management skills or hire you know, external managers already have those skills. Okay. Um, okay. Well, Burley Bike Trail has collapsed when um, things were getting a bit raggy. Uh, the members uh, uh, were failing to cope with cheap Chinese imports. There's a great paper being written about this. Um, uh, and so they brought in a, a, a very highly skilled chief executive from other businesses uh, you know capitalist businesses and he then um, uh, uh, suppressed all the cooperating in the business and imposed uh, strict command and control uh, and that was the end of that was the end of burley bikes the problem is that unless that m most mbas most management skills most management textbooks are systems based and there's Im implicit hierarchy in all of those systems so if you can't get them to work you either go back and say i couldn't get it to work or you impose a hierarchy and that's very dangerous um actually i found that some of the best co-ops where people know very little about management but they know quite a lot about life and they get along together and they learn what they need to learn very rapidly extremely rapidly and they can break things down so for example at SUMA there is no finance director because finance directors are too dangerous and too expensive there's about five people doing that job each doing a different bit of it and helping and supporting each other to do it you just do it a different way yeah thanks okay next question I hope that's okay, okay. thank you uh, okay, let's move on to Eva. Eva, I will unmute you. You go ahead and ask your question. Go ahead. Hi, Bob. Uh, thank you very much for, for all of that. I've had some experience working in agile projects, um, but I'm also the co-op education coordinator for the BC Co-op Association, and we're redesigning our Cooperate Now program, which is where we're basically teaching people how to start co-ops. Um, and we've been kind of wanting to move away from the approach of like this is the the way that you develop rules and kind of take that really really take that step back i guess um so i'm wondering whether whether you thought about how this applies to like how we teach people about starting co-ops and like how it, how it correlates with like the foundations of building a co-op itself Absolutely. Um, there's a very cheap and easy way of starting a co-op. You turn up with a bunch of people, you talk them through the various legal rules available, 
um, and then uh, they choose one of them. You change a few words in those rules, you register it, you go job done, and you get paid for it. Uh, I, you know, those people never look inside that document. They have no idea what it means. They don't know. Uh, they don't know how to operate it, or how to operationalize it. They don't have the relationships with each other, even though they might be friends. And in fact, doing it the sort of systems way disengages and disempowers people who are already working together very well as a group of friends. So, uh, as I said, um, the example of the North American uh, co-housing network, intentional communities network, was revelationary to me because I'd never come across a, a group of people who are so, so understood the need for developing good relationships between participants before you do anything concrete at all um, and obviously in that process some people leave they think well no, this isn't what I thought it was going to be I'm leaving and other people come in but you end up with a group of people who understand how to get along together uh, and who can then use techniques like you know sociocracy which is all the rage at the moment in worker co-ops in a properly relating way and not to use it in a way to dominate people who, uh, you know, well, you, you can manipulate anything to dominate people because they think they need to have a hierarchy, they need to have some control in this, this madhouse. Um, whereas actual fact, a, a good madhouse can result in some brilliant collective action, provided this boundaries to how crazy people behave. I hope that I hope that's okay. Um, but we should, you know, we should concentrate on the people first and how they get along together, and then then we'll get around to talking about what it is they're actually going to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Okay. Thank you Eva, for your question. Okay. Up next is Sweet Potato, and then Julian, you'll be on deck. Go ahead. Uh, hi. So, I, you know, I, I think myself and a lot of people work better when there's some level of accountability for the work I'm doing. Uh, so when I'm self-employed doing contracting for like landscaping or whatever, it's just harder to get that motivation to work for myself. Um, but I think a lot of people depend on hierarchy for that accountability. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, you must do this task. You must like show up for these hours or whatever. So what does like some level of accountability look like in like a cooperative management scenario That's a great question thank you very much and i'm smiling because of a, a, an answer i once gave to a journalist uh, at suma uh, she said you mean there's no chief executive here looking out across the warehouse with all these you know scores of people all beavering away working really hard and fast and i said oh don't make that mistake there's 120 chief executives here, and they'll all give you their opinion if you ask them. Um, so um, accountability is very strong in in this sort of uh, arrangement. It's it's much stronger because you can't. It's very, much more difficult to hide from a higher authority. Um, you can't, you know, be friends with the chief exec who forgives you your sins, whereas somebody else is picked on for getting the slightest little thing wrong you know it's a bit like being at the court of henry the eighth where if you looked the wrong way you lost your head you know whereas other people could behave appallingly because he thought they were funny so you know he let them do it um uh so don't make the mistake that, that there is no accountability but also even as a as somebody who's self-employed tending to work by themselves working with your clients and avoiding the um, avoiding the excuse me a second. I'm still live, you know. Yeah. We can hear all of that. Um, sorry, this uh, noise is off. Uh, where was I? Um, uh, 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 I got a bit lost there. Sorry. About accountability and having everyone as being accountable to each other. Oh yeah. So I mean, you could use these principles in working with uh, your clients um, and trying to get them to communicate with you in an ongoing and an emerging way about what they want. Maybe using some 
agile techniques. You don't have to do it formally. You can use the techniques. So they actually end up with what they want and maybe not what they thought they wanted when they started. You know, they might want, oh, we want a big formal garden. And as you're doing it, you may think, you know, they, they may go, hmm, not sure we like this. Oh, dear. No, this isn't what we wanted. You tell him. No, you tell him. Oh, no, God, he's done too much now, you know, rather than that ongoing relationship. Uh, so, OK, so we, we, we can use it in different ways. Thank you. We actually have three more questions coming up. So next is Julian Manley, who actually was our webinar speaker for the last webinar. Folks want to go back and review that video. I'll unmute you now, Julian. Hi, 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 Bob. Um, great talk, thank you, Bob. Um, my talk, my question to you is related to um, the Mondragon system because, um, as you know, in Mondragon, uh, they yeah. they have very large cooperatives and uh, they do have quite a, a strong system which they attempt not to make hierarchical but they have been criticized from some cooperative quarters for for veering too much towards uh, a traditional management system um, and they struggle with that and at the moment they're they're, they're going back towards uh, encouraging um, a cultural approach which I think is what uh, you're talking about here about negotiating uh, all the time um, but I wonder if you um, would like to say something about um, to what extent it's necessary to combine uh, negotiations and cooperate uh, cooperating values uh, with a some form of system when the uh, cooperative becomes huge by cooperative standards. In other words, you could no longer have a, exactly a group of friends, but, but you have a cooperative that's got 500, 600, 700 people, and when you get to that size, it's necessary to have some element of system. The question is, what kind of system? Yeah, that, the, yes, I, I, I yes, Julian, yeah. Uh, I, I quite understand what you mean. Well, the, the phrase at SUMA is that management is seen as a function and not a status. It's something organization has to be done. You know, organizing things and organizing people has to be done. Um, but, and I, I got the impression from Mondragon when I visited that they have the same attitude you know, you might be called the chief executive, but you're exactly the same as all the other workers in actual in, in status terms. And that's why you're only paid, you know, the, the chief executive of the bank is only paid nine times as much as the the bank clerk on the on the front counter. I mean, in soon, of course, we'd say, why are they paid any more? You know, why aren't they just paid the same? But I understand that doesn't go everywhere, it doesn't work everywhere. Um and I remember one of the one of them being asked, well, how, how do you tolerate this? And he said, well, because I can go back and go in the bar, be alongside my former colleagues who I grew up with and we're just friends. You know, I don't have to go and hide on my luxury island somewhere because I've made so many enemies and lots of money. Uh, and that was a very human way of thinking about what pe what it, what that person wanted in life. Um, Meet social objects, that theory, that we can agree on uh, on certain structures or themes, as we could call them, uh, which are there and we all agree on them, but times may change and then they change. And that's certainly what I experienced at SUMA. We have things, um, so for example, I keep going back to the rotor as we called it, or roster as most people know it, um, at one time, that's seen as a concrete law, you must do it. And at other times, as, as uh, attitudes change, it's more flexible. And at other times, it's just a guide, and then maybe that doesn't work, so we have to get an agreement that it goes back to being a bit more of a law. You know? And it's, it's that we've got that central pillar of the agreement, but quite how it happens is flexible depending on the time. Uh, and I, and if you, if you think about, and I, I think that we can find a way around this. Is this this is not a revolutionary way of thinking because it's actually the way people do relate to each other. It's reality. The systems ideology is the artificial one that we've been led to believe is real, um, because it suits some people to do that because they like to be in control, uh, and other people are terrified of not doing as the controllers 
once so you no know, it's all maintained but in actual fact in our daily lives we actually behave in this complex responsive process of relating way and it's not beyond our wit to think up ways of controlling or managing very big organizations along that along those lines i mean for example the social co-ops in italy 15,000 of them uh, no more than 100 members in each and they did that because they didn't want a co-op of more than 100 members because they knew they'd lose control of it so they come together in gigantic voluntary consortia which have a lot of power and um, but the members uh, enjoy a small human sized group of people to work with that's one way of doing it okay thank you thank you julian for the question Okay, next up we have Audrey. We'll see uh, how time goes, if we can uh, do one after that. But we'll save a couple minutes for wrap up uh, at the end there. So Audrey, you're up. Audrey Keynes. Hi, um, so earlier you talked about just sort of the ine uh, inevitability of having some hierarchy embedded in a cooperative system, even though it's attempting to avoid that. And you mentioned it as a product of just how long people have been around for, among other things. Is there anything that you can talk about a little bit more um, that our tools or just methods that you've used or seen that work well to prevent that from getting really embedded and sort of institutionalized in the cooperative? Yeah, this is, this is a very important subject actually, because there is a thing called the iron law of oligarchy. Uh, Mitchell, is that his name? Can't remember now. Anyway, it was invented by this guy. I think he, I think he was American because he observed that democratic organizations always tended towards oligarchy. Though I think he meant representative democracy where you elect your representatives and we see that as a strong tendency, don't we? And then because he saw it as inevitable, I believe he went to Italy and joined the Italian fascists in the 1930s. You know, if, if we're gonna have an iron law, we, I may as well be in it. Anyway, uh, so it is something we need to be very careful about. Um, um, it's about empowering people uh, to say, for example, principles of sociocracy, everybody has a say. Nobody's opinion is more powerful or more relevant than anybody else's. And again, I used to see this at SUMA when we'd be talking, say, in a big meeting about you know, the future and uh, one of the warehouse workers um, would say, well, I think we need to sort out the pallets in the warehouse before we do any of this because it's causing chaos, you know, uh, falling over them all over the place because we just haven't got round to sorting them out. And you think, oh, for goodness sake, you know, we're talking about the future. But actually, that was a real concrete thing that needed doing on Monday to make life better and make the business work better. Uh, and in many circumstances, that he would have been just dismissed as, oh, that's that's below us because we operate in the realm of you know theory um but he was empowered to say things like that not at great length but he was empowered to say things like that and everybody's taught to respect each other's opinions and that's very much that's very much peer reviewed uh, and sociocracies i think is is trying to get towards that everybody's opinion is valued everybody's opinion is heard uh, nobody has the right to block things by vetoing them, but we will uh, we will respect people's opinions and objections, and we will work around to a solution which is good enough for now, safe enough to try, and then we'll get on with the job. And so there are there are ways of doing it, um, but I mean so again going back to the uh, the North American co housing network, some of the techniques that they use are um uh what's the name of the uh, the book famous book uh no 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 i can't remember it anyway sorry i might have to write it down find it and write it down later on goes through lots of techniques and uh i've experienced quite a few of them and they work pretty well and i think their success rate of the founding communities has uh, sustainable communities has improved a lot But of course, those ideas are often just seen as, mm. isn't it funny how most HR women, you know, it's like, well, oh, that's women's work. We can ignore it. The people ignore it. Let's go with the finance and the operations and the marketing. 
in the strategy, you know. That's that's proper man's work, isn't it? Anyway, I bet I better finish there. <laughs> 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 oh, we like a little truth in reality. <laughs> no, thank you everyone so much for your questions. I, uh, I, I want to acknowledge you, Bob, for, um, you know, being willing to do the work that you do when a lot of people are saying, no, 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 let's just try it harder, the standard way. <laughs> it's kind of like the approach to capitalism sometimes, it seems. Um, but I definitely want to thank you for, um, for testing thing, these things out over time. And, and I know it's uh, probably not been a very straightforward process, but rather iterative, um, as well as being able to share them with us in a way that's that we understand the philosophical underpinnings, but at the same time, uh, we're able to understand in, in practical terms how it is applied. So I very much thank you for that and for your time today and for everyone to be here uh, in, everything that you're dealing with uh, in order to make yourself available to be here and to continue learning and wanting to improve your work. So um, we do have uh, another webinar coming up that I'll highlight as well. So it's coming up on May 27th. You'll see it there on the screen. Uh, it's with Marcelo Vieta and uh, Marcelo is, is an instructor in our programs and, and leads our study tours to, um, to Mondragon and to Mondragon. Wow. Mondragon. This is my two-year-old uh, daughter. Uh, she is a please. credit union member. She comes by these things honestly already. She's only two. Um, and you'll see there the other um, the other webinars that we've already had as part of this series. That you'll be able to see the video recordings for uh, at managementstudies.coop. So we are just coming to the hour. So I'll thank you, everyone. I know that there are still a few people with questions. So for anybody that needs to go, We'll uh, we'll let them go, but Bob, if you're able to stay a couple of minutes, perhaps we can address a couple more. No, uh, questions that's sure. Yeah, yeah. And thanks okay. very much, everybody, for listening. I'm really pleased to be able to share this. Thank you for your patience. Wonderful. Okay, so I'll jump to a couple more questions here. So I think uh, the next one was from. Oh, we just have a number of thank yous coming in. Is Wes still on the line? No. Okay, a few people have had to go. Okay, and we did want to uh, say that we will send a follow-up to this webinar by tomorrow, uh, and so you'll get the link to the recording. We'll also, if we come up with the name of that book, we'll include that in there as well so that you have it. And uh, and if you need anything else or anything else percolated, as you saw in the handout that's attached there at the pre-reading, you'll see Bob's email address in there, so you can follow up directly as well. Um, I should also mention that if you have any ideas for future webinars or you're doing something involved in something, research or practice, uh, that you think should be highlighted to this community, then we are already starting to plan for our fall and winter webinar series. So please do be in touch with me. You'll see my contact information. Again, I'm Erin Hancock, the Education Manager. Um, you'll see that on our website at managementstudies.coop as well. Okay, Wes says, thank you. It was good to be introduced to your work. I do have a question, but I have to dash. I'll email you. <laughs> Lots to think about, says Eva. Thank you, this was great. Uh, Tara Williams uh, said, thanks for arranging this to the center, great topics. So it uh, looks like no more questions coming in right now, just uh, accolades. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so That's it looks like great. we can, uh, let me see, is there one more? Okay, yep. that's great. So yeah, that's everything, so we'll end it there and I'll, uh, I'll get the recording loaded to our channel. Yep, so bye everyone, my, my image is reversed. It's, whoop, there we go, there's my hand. <laughs> <laughs> bye, bye everyone, thank you very much. Thank you, Erin, thanks very much. Take care, thank you so much, Bob. Bye. Thank you, bye.